manipulation. A South Korean designer claims to have invented an oxygen mask which can draw air from water as you swim. Fraud. Our prototype didn't meet the criteria. False promises. We can't guarantee that Fontis will deliver a constant water output in all conditions and may produce little or no water at all. Today we'll tell the story of some of the biggest scams in the history of crowdfunding, where the backers risked losing millions of dollars. And to this day, many wonder how so many people fell for such blatant scams. At first glance, Scarpa looked like any old razor. But it had one key difference that many felt would revolutionize shaving. In place of the traditional blade was a small red laser. This supposedly had a plethora of benefits. It would allow closer contact without burns, irritation, or accidental cuts. It was also more environmentally friendly. And all it required was a single AAA battery, good for up to 50,000 hours. The concept became a media sensation, being covered in outlets like ABC, CBS, and NBC. They advertised these features while pointing out it was now available for pre-order. Because of this, Scarp easily surpassed the $160,000 goal, as tens of thousands backed them. By early October, it accumulated over $4 million. But not everything was as it seemed. What has to be understood is that Kickstarter requires a working prototype for projects to remain on the site. This should have been no issue given that the page mentioned several. That included one built for aluminum, and a video demonstration. Yet on October 12th, the entire campaign was shut down. The decision was explained in an email sent to all 20,000 people who donated. We've concluded it is in violation of our rule requiring working prototypes of physical products that are offered as rewards. Accordingly, all funding has been stopped and backers will not be charged for their pledges. It turns out the campaign was extremely misleading and fell apart under scrutiny. In fact, this was noted on Reddit by a user who outlined these issues a week prior. They first examined photos of the aluminum prototype. Its supposed laser resembled a red LED and bore little resemblance to the one seen on the video. The vid itself was no better. It once again lacked the laser with a thin gray wire instead. It cuts just three hairs over the course of 45 seconds. The author then questions Scarp's previous response to these criticisms. They wrote, Once we're in production, we'll have alphas and betas, which we'll keep all our backers updated on. But the fibers are created at once in mass, so there's no point in extra expenses and time to run a prototype batch. The author argues, This means they don't even have a single working prototype. They're either hoping it will magically improve with mass production, or they're knowingly scamming millions of dollars out of people. I'd bet on the latter. Scarp responded by uploading a second video of the Razor in action. But it's kept far away from the camera, so there's no way of verifying what was actually being used. In the end, none of their evidence was enough to remain on Kickstarter. Their CIO later claimed the removal was due to pressure from special interest lobbying. He refused to elaborate on the who or why. In spite of all this, Scarp remained steadfast in their campaign. Within hours, the startup made an identical page on Indiegogo. It was done with the explicit permission from the site, who were, quote, excited and extremely helpful. This campaign had flexible funding, meaning they'd keep the money even if the target wasn't reached. While one might expect the project to flop given these developments, it didn't. In fact, Scarp received another $500,000. Though a fraction of the original $4 million, that was still over double their goal. Much of it came from people who kept faith in their vision. One backer was quoted in The Verge stating, I'm trusting you, but you lost the Kickstarter for a very good reason. Get one working prototype that delivers, just one, that delivers the quick and easy shave you promised. In spite of all this, Scarp remained steadfast in their campaign. Unfortunately, their hopes were dashed as the release date of March 2016 came and went. The comments were quickly filled with backers infuriated by the lack of communication. Many pointed out the engineers began making extravagant purchases. That included new cars, watches, and vacations, which they documented on social media. 
Interestingly, though there hadn't been updates in months, these criticisms were swiftly deleted. That July, CNET reached out to co-founders Morgan and Paul. Morgan assured them that the engineering was largely done, and that it would be out by the end of the year. However, he refused to promise regular updates. Then, he stated they wouldn't be offering refunds. The only silver lining to this was the involvement of Will King. The founder of King of Shaves was signed on as their chief marketing officer and advisor. His role was to help find investors for mass production, but that was under the assumption it would reach that point. To this day, not a single working prototype of SCARP has ever been shipped. Behind the scenes, things quickly fell apart. In October of 2018, Paul left the company. He went on to file a lawsuit against SCARP technology over a breach of contract. The case remains ongoing as of writing. In November of 2020, SCARP was dissolved by Morgan. In spite of this, he continued to post updates implying the razor was still being made. That only stopped in March of 2022. Perhaps it's no coincidence that a year later, the man filed for bankruptcy. Morgan had noticeably become more erratic over the years, and occasionally let on more than he should have. That included an exchange where he admitted nothing they made worked. He then blamed its failure on Kickstarter shutdown, stating, It could have been shipped by now and would have been much bigger. The former CEO then finally names the special interests lobbying against them as being just internet trolls. None of the backers on Indiegogo have received their reward or a refund. The comments make it clear that they've attempted to report this information to the site to no avail. Whether or not that will change or the incident will be swept under the rug remains to be seen. While this may seem outrageous enough on its own, this is only the tip of the iceberg on insane crowdfunding scams. We'll learn more about the others after a brief word from our sponsor. It's an unfortunate fact of modern day life that anyone can find anything about you on the internet, including your full name, your personal email, your home address, phone number, and even your relatives. This information is accessible because of data brokers, who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers, and anyone else that wants to learn more about you. And that's why I'm excited about today's sponsor, Aura. To put it simply, Aura will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. As a person myself who has some notoriety on the internet, this is extremely helpful and anyone that doesn't want that stuff out there should definitely consider using this service. On top of this, Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you recommendations on what to do. Aura's app also features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and protects your device from malware. They basically have almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside one app. That's why I suggest you let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link below. You'll be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over these two weeks. So to try it out for yourself, go to Aura.com GFM to start your free trial. The link will also be provided down below, or you could scan the QR code available on the screen right now. Based out of the UK, Torkin Group Limited had quite an esteemed reputation. They were known for their innovations in aerospace and defense technology. But most promising was the passion project of CEO Ivan Reedman. Ivan took particular interest in nano UAVs, which are tiny unarmed military vehicles. He sought to reduce their size as much as possible without impacting their capabilities. It was to great success, even getting praise from Wales' Secretary of State at the time. But as their research developed, it led them to contemplate a new market. What if this tech could reach consumers? The company first thought of this concept in late 2013, and a year later, they were ready to seek funding from the public. In November of 2014, they officially unveiled Xano, the world's most sophisticated nano drone. It captured photos and video while being small enough to fit in your palm. 
The remote control was a smartphone app to add further simplicity, but the true selling point was its autonomy. The drone was intelligent enough to pilot itself. It followed the user automatically, and could even take selfies. In spite of these ambitious features, it was set to ship out to backers as early as next June. They claimed this was possible because their supply chain was ready to go. The promotional video only affirmed this, showing the drone in action. The whole campaign seemed too good to be true, but with such credentials, there was no reason to doubt their claims. The project went on to become the most funded Kickstarter project in Europe. It shot past the original budget, earning 2.3 million euro. That was approximately 3.5 million dollars at the time. This achieved all their stretch goals, unlocking even more features. The machine would now boast thermal imaging, wireless charging, and more. Following this, updates began to be posted every week. They gave insight on their stages of production and showed the assembly lines. As the release date crept closer, interest in the device only grew. Because of this, Xano decided to take pre-orders. This resulted in 3,000 additional units being sold. In total, the company was now responsible for 15,000 drones. Everything appeared to be going well, as Xano was on track to become one of the site's biggest success stories. Unfortunately, it wasn't long after that things began to slow down. There seemed to be a constant string of complications, culminating in the June deadline being missed. It wouldn't be until early September that drones were finally sent out. In total, 600 were shipped to consumers, but rather than backers, they were instead sent to pre-orders. This prioritization infuriated the thousands who had invested under that promise. Even those who received the device weren't thrilled. The Xanos were reported to be barely operational. The following is an excerpt describing the various issues from British journalist Mark Harris. They reported that drones would repeatedly bunny hop a few centimeters in the air before landing again, or veer off wildly to crash into walls. Video quality was dreadful, and there was no sign of even basic obstacle avoidance or gesture control, let alone fully autonomous flight. There would be no refuge for their backers. On November 10th, Ivan abruptly resigned resigned from torquing, citing irreconcilable differences. He appeared devastated by its state, writing, The last seven years of my life are in TG. Everything I have worked so hard for is in TG, and to no longer be able to be part of everything I have built only makes me suffer even more. This led some journalists to suggest that the company was in a serious crisis and on the verge of collapse. Eight days later, that speculation was proven correct when Torking announced it was entering a creditor's voluntary liquidation. This is roughly equivalent to an American Chapter 7 bankruptcy. They had spent all of their funding and were now liquidating the assets. We are greatly disappointed with the outcome of the Xano project, and we would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has supported us during this difficult period, especially our loyal employees, whose commitment has exceeded all expectations. The page erupted in backlash, accumulating over 8,000 comments. One user started a a petition declaring it Kickstarter's biggest fraud and demanding full refunds. It received almost 3,000 signatures. Even the few who received their device weren't very lucky. The drone was only functional if it could connect to their server upon being turned on. Those servers were shut down after the announcement, rendering the machine useless. This level of disaster over the span of a year seemed implausible. To many, the only rational explanation was a misuse of funds. In fact, the ordeal was suspicious enough that Kickstarter itself began to question it. But they were unable to contact Torking, whose creators disappeared from the internet. That December, Kickstarter hired journalist Mark Harris to investigate the startup. He was to research Xano's creators and pay special attention to where the money had gone. This was to determine if it had been a deliberate scam. The process took five weeks, as Mark mulled over documents and interviewed as many people as he could. In the end, he concluded it was not the result of foul play. 
The evidence instead pointed to the firm being incompetent. They were unequipped to mass produce the drone, as the issues only continued to mount. Then the money ran out due to their poor financial awareness. But as Harris pointed out, none of them ended up rich on the backs of the crowd. However, there was still one key discrepancy, the campaign's original promotional video. Why were the shipped Xano so inferior in comparison? In his own analysis, Harris found several red flags that the ad was manipulated. Several scenes appeared to be either reversed or slowed down. Many purported drone shots resembled the work of a videographer they'd hired. The Xano is never shown in a continuous shot from takeoff through flight, and one scene has visible effects matting suggesting its display was replaced in post. These were all violations of Kickstarter's hardware and product design project guidelines. They state, Projects cannot simulate events to demonstrate what it might do in the future. Projects can only be shown performing actions they are able to perform in their current state. Product images must be photos of the prototype as it currently exists. Ivan denied using CGI, other drones, or even selfie sticks in their footage, but he did admit that the video showed features that were not operational at the time. If this is the case, it stands to reason the campaign was still misleading and possibly even a scam. Unfortunately, it appears Kickstarter disagreed, as none of the 12,000 backers had their money returned. With that said, Xano has somehow managed to live on, at least in spirit. In February of 2017, a million euro worth of components from the drones were auctioned off, and similarly, their assets and IP were purchased by the company Extreme Flyers. In 2018, Extreme Flyers produced new editions of Xano for display at that year's CE event. Its owner loved the campaign's promise of consumer access and hoped to fulfill it one day themselves. It seems, however, that the brand was viewed too negatively for it to succeed. Following the stunt, the Xano drone was never seen again. One of the most successful types of campaigns are those that promise to improve everyday life. That was the case with Fontis, which had launched on Indiegogo in 2016. Named after the Roman god of wells and springs, it claimed to be the world's first self-filling water bottle. The device purportedly turned moisture from the air into drinking water. That meant it was functional even in the desert. It also had a lower chamber to remineralize harvested water. Not only did this seem essential for travel, but they promised those who pledged at least $165 their very own. It proved a success, raising well over $300,000 for 1,400 backers. Yet, even from the start, there was cause for concern. The creators note they hadn't yet created a functional prototype, and its science seemed dubious. The description explains that air is first run through a filter into the chambers. Then, a series of smaller solar-powered coolers bring out and condense the moisture. This results in water, which drips into the main body. However, YouTuber EV Blog uploaded a video investigating the process. So now we can actually do a calculation for one hour. Now they claim uh, to be able to produce uh, one liter of water in 150 minutes in a 90% uh, humidity environment at 40 degrees Celsius, okay? Using basic thermodynamics as well as the company's own numbers, he found it was scientifically impossible. It was so egregious that he concluded they likely fabricated the data. In response, Fontis issued a statement to their supporters. The team admitted the graphics were fictitious and merely for illustrative purposes. They then said the science was incomplete as their true mechanisms were confidential. In the end, the team not only kept support but received help from the Austrian government, who offered to fund the second phase of development. But as the months went by and there seemed to be no progress, that patience waned. Every month, the backers were given new excuses as to why there was no working prototypes. That included a post in September claiming they'd integrated graphene into the design. This was in spite of the material costing twice the price of gold at the time. Months later, they finally unveiled the first actual photo of the prototype. It had no resemblance to the advertised design, and as many pointed out, functioned like a dehumidifier. 
the deadline of April 2017 came and went as it remained in the concept stage. In May, the team revealed the bottle's new design, but the more attentive noticed new fine print. Drinking distilled water for longer periods of time is not recommended. Gradually, updates became infrequent, with the final posts coming in August of 2018. Here, Fontis wrote that at the request of new investors, it was being scrutinized by a third party. Revealingly, the post ends with a sentence, The fate of this project seems to be out of our hands now, and we can only hope for a positive outcome soon. It seems that the writing was on the wall for the team, because just a month later, Fontis went bankrupt. This development received a little to no attention. It seems the Austrian government was desperate to sweep it under the rug, embarrassed to have ever invested. Immediately, all references to the project were removed from their site. Fontis's creator also deleted his account and left without a trace. It's unknown if he had intentionally crafted a scam, but the product was a complete hoax and fundamentally impossible. Unfortunately, no one would be held accountable, with his once supporters yet to see any recourse. Named after the Greek god of the sea, Triton set out to change swimming forever. They designed artificial gills that allowed humans to breathe underwater. This was achieved with a respirator that gave the user oxygen by biting. It was even said to last upwards of 45 minutes. With such a promise, the $299 pre-order seemed like a steal. The cheapest options quickly sold out as the campaign exploded. Within weeks, the project amassed nearly a million dollars, but not everyone was convinced. The fundraiser appeared out of nowhere and just seemed too good to be true. This was a concept that had eluded both the world's top scientists and military contractors. If such an advancement was made, Triton would have easily found investors themselves. This suspicion was felt within Gear Junkie, an outlet about outdoor gear. On March 25, 2016, the site published an article questioning Triton's legitimacy. That included opinions by experts who agreed the product was impossible. Their issues lied in three major points. Firstly, it needed to produce 90 liters of water per minute to produce enough air to breathe. That necessitated far greater power than the model was capable of. Similarly, the system lacked a reservoir to hold the compressed air. And finally, the device had no metering. You see, below 15 feet, pure oxygen becomes poisonous. This is addressed in scuba gear through a regulator that mixes it with other gases. Not having this made the gills an extreme safety risk for consumers, but it was unimaginable to fulfill any of those mechanisms into such a small device. When reached for comment, Triton declined to respond, but Indiegogo initiated an investigation after being sent the article. On March 31st, they told Gear Junkie the project was under internal review. Within 24 hours, Triton shut down their page willfully and refunded all the proceeds. However, they disputed the product being a scam. The team apologized for being secretive as it was to protect proprietary technology. They sought to fix the issue by launching another more honest campaign. That included revealing the new aspect to the design, that it was using liquid oxygen. Unfortunately, this explanation wouldn't suffice either. Liquid oxygen is cryogenic and must be stored at extremely low temperatures. Once again, this was infeasible given the design and nature of snorkeling. Beyond that, the volume could only supply divers with one or two breaths, a far cry from artificial gills. Ultimately, Triton did little to actually address their product being literally impossible. Yet somehow the campaign managed to raise another half a million dollars. For months, it seemed like Triton would get away with their scheme, but that changed in June when the second fundraiser was abruptly shut down. As it turns out, Indiegogo had continued looking into the project and decided to ban it for good. The following message was then sent to backers. Over a month ago, our trust and safety team reached out to the Triton team in response to numerous questions from our community surrounding the claims made in their most recent campaign. Despite our repeated requests to substantiate these claims, the Triton team have not been able to comply. 
the money was returned as Trajan ultimately left empty-handed. They never made another statement on the matter, instead hoping to be forgotten. The project's website and social media accounts quickly disappeared. Not long after, so did the online presence of their individual team members. Interestingly, Indiegogo's decision to act may not have been fully self-motivated. Days after the relaunch, a page was started on their site to denounce the gills as a scam. It was updated after the ban with insight on the project's end. We organized a small group of volunteers here in San Francisco Bay Area to put pressure on Indiegogo. My company provides litigation for a number of prominent local law firms, including ones that specialize in diving and marine-related litigation. We called in some favors to get them to participate with us so that they would be taken seriously. We had a large package of documents with supporting legal materials delivered by certified mail to the vice president and general counsel of Indiegogo. We also obtained the support and assistance of a California legislative assemblyman who expressed his willingness to spearhead an investigation if the outcome, indeed, was misappropriation of funds from innocent contributors. It seems the crowdfunding sites had their hand forced by threats of legal action. Given their general inaction towards other stunts, it proved worthwhile. Because thankfully in this story, their due diligence was done and no one was hurt. So there you have the story of the Kickstarter scammers. And it really makes you wonder how crowdfunding became so successful in the first place. It essentially made you take all the risk of an investor without any of the profits. So with that, I think I'll end the video here. And until next time, thanks for watching.